Open your Bibles with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 34. Isaiah 34. Since today marks the 50th anniversary of the day after, the day after the six-day Arab-Israeli war of June 5, June 5 through 10 of 1967, I think it's only fitting that today we would return to our sermon series that we did start several weeks back on the subject of the controversy of Zion. And this series is based on this text here in Isaiah chapter 34, verse 8 in particular, which says, For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. This series of messages is about the modern state of Israel, and about what has over the course of the past century and more become the dominant hot spot of international attention and conflict and of controversy about the question of who has a right to the Holy Land, that land that was once promised to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob and to their descendants. And the purpose for the series of messages is to look very closely at what the Bible says about the nation of Israel and also to look at the facts of recent history as well and the Zionist movement over the past century and a half because I want to promote a balanced view and a proper Christian view, actually, of this controversy of Zion. Thousands of years ago, Almighty God revealed to us through His prophets that one day we would see the very controversy that has been brewing for decades and that will be heating up in days to come and maybe years to come in that tiny nation of Israel. As we stated uh, last time, this is not just a controversy between Arabs and Jews or between Israelis and and Palestinians. It's also a matter of controversy among Christians themselves, Uh, with some Christians on one extreme taking the preterist position of replacement theology uh, that the modern state of Israel has no biblical or prophetic significance at all, that God is forever through with the nation of Israel as a people, with the Jews as a people, and with Israel as a nation, and that the Israel that exists today is not of God's doing or not a part of God's plan. Many Christians believe that. Uh, I've gone to some length to, to prove and to explain in this series of messages why that position is completely unbiblical, and that God is not through with Israel as a nation or with the Jews as a people, and that the Jews, whoever they are, however we define them, however God defines them, it must be regathered to that land on the eastern edge of the Mediterranean Sea, and they must be regathered, as I've tried to get across, while still in a state of unbelief to set the stage for the return of Christ uh, to that land. And this, I believe, is what the Bible teaches, like it or not. But there are also others on the opposite, even more heretical extreme, who take a hyper-dispensational, militant Zionist so-called Christian Zionist position, even a warmongering position, as promoted by John Hagee and others, that the Jews are God's chosen covenant people by birthright, whether or not they come to God through Christ or the gospel, which is heretical as it can be, that they have a right to dispossess, steal property from, and annihilate, if necessary, the Palestinian population, many of whom, by the way, historically have in fact been Christian. Right whose families occupied that land before the Jews began moving in during the last century. And they believe that America's foreign policy should be dominated by military uh, aid or even intervention on Israel's behalf to protect them uh, because apparently God can't protect them. So America has to, right? But I I hope to show in this message that that is neither a biblical uh, nor a Christian position to take. In this message... Uh, I'm going to first give a very brief overview of the points covered in the first four parts of the series, uh, which has focused on what the Bible says about the regathering of Israel to the land, which, as we stated, must happen before Christ's glorious return, and actually must happen while Israel is still in a state of unbelief, as we see that they are now still in. But then I'm going to turn our our focus and our attention more to the facts of recent history, including the history of the Jewish Zionist movement over the past century and a half after first covering 
uh, some more detailed history of the events that transpired 50 years ago last week in the Six-Day Arab-Israeli War. When, in, when Israel intentionally attacked not only her Arab neighbors, but also an American naval vessel as well. As Christians who love the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, and who believe both the Old Testament and the New Testament to be God's divinely inspired holy word, Christians have a natural and a really a quite um, understandable tendency to favor Israel in this controversy. That's completely understandable. However, most Christians have, as I did also, until fairly recently, allowed a, actually allowed several outright lies that have been fed to us as historical facts to cloud our thinking and even our sense of biblical law and Christian ethics and even basic morality, compassion, and human decency when it comes to the question of how to deal with the non-Jewish Palestinian population and the occupied territories that were seized by Israel in that 1967 Six-Day War 50 years ago. Many of whom, the Palestinians are Christian, by the way, as we pointed out, and most of whom are actually no more anti-Christian than the secular, Christ-rejecting, and anti-Christian majority population of Israel, the Israeli Jews. The controlled media brainwashing machine that has existed in this nation for a very long time, uh, since actually long before anyone who hears this message uh, were even born. And that includes so-called Christian media, by the way, have sold the once predominantly Christian American population a pack of very big lies on this issue throughout the 20th century and even to the present time about the recent history of modern Israel that we need to refute and expose. One of those big lies is the lie that the 1967 Arab-Israeli Six-Day War was for Israel's part a defensive war. As one of our good friends writes, that Israel took East Jerusalem and the West Bank during the 1967 Six-Day War that was started by Egypt, Jordan, and Syria when they massed troops on Israel's border. That is the common story. That's a common lie. That's not true. And our friend simply remains just as deceived on that point as I was until recently when I was compelled to take a hard look at this issue. Another lie that we've actually been spoon-fed is the fallacy that Palestinians don't exist, as some Christian Zionists are proposing or promoting, that there are no Palestinians for us to concern ourselves about uh, because they're all just Arabs and they're you know, Egyptians and Jordanians and they just came in there and they moved in when Israel came in, and that's just not true. It's actually that, that whole proposition, that notion, is a rather ridiculous notion that is actually very easily debunked simply by looking at the history of the region going back actually to the 7th century A.D., and in particular at the demographic records of, this, of the region of Palestine in the late 1800s and going into the early 1900s before the Jews began immigrating en masse into the region, which we'll uh, come back to in part six of the message series. But because the historical facts have been heavily skewed and distorted by a heavily Zionist favoring American media, and because that distorted view of history was drastically affected, has drastically affected the way Christians apply even the timeless truths of God's word to this controversy. We've, we've allowed this distorted view of history to uh, skew the way we interpret the Bible. And we need to, therefore, take a hard look not only at the scriptures, but also at the facts of recent history as it relates to Israel and to Palestine. And I say all that uh, to explain why this message and the next, part six, will be extremely fact-intensive, because we need to look at the facts. Christians must, must take a hard look at the actual facts of history to have proper balance on this issue. So please bear with me. Uh, in these messages and try to follow along as I do attempt to put the facts of the matter on the table for consideration, at least for those relatively few that will hear this message. First, I need to briefly review some points we've made thus far in the series of messages. I'm going to start by looking very closely at this passage right here in Isaiah chapter 34. 
Now, so far, all we've done in this chapter is to look at this one verse. Verse 8, just a, just a quote from it. But I want to come back now and look at the context here of this verse. Isaiah 34, verse 1. It says, Come near, ye nations, to hear, and hearken, ye people. Let the earth hear, and all that is therein, the world, and all things that come forth of it. Most of Isaiah's prophecies were directed specifically to the nation of Israel. Some of them were directed to the nations around Egypt, um, you know, Syria, Edom to the east. But Isaiah states right up front in this chapter that this is a general prophecy to all the nations of the world because this prophecy is clearly about what the Lord will do among the nations at the end of this age when He comes at the final judgment of the earth. And as such, this chapter incorporates language that actually is very uh, well known, quoted by the Lord Jesus and the Apostle John and when they describe the same events in the Olivet Discourse and also in the book of Revelation. Verse 2 says, For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and His fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them, He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Verse 3 says, Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up upon their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. Skipping over verse 4 for a moment down to verse 5. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Edomia, that's Edom, and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Edomia. And the unicorns shall come down with them, and the bullocks with the bulls, and their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fatness. Here we see this very same imagery that we see in Zechariah 12 and 14, where God says, For I will gather all nations, it talks about all nations, gather all nations uh, against Jerusalem to battle, and so come to pass in that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. This chapter is about those nations that come against Jerusalem. That's what verse 8 is about. It's also the same scene, by the way, that we see pictured in Revelation 14 and 19 at the Battle of Armageddon. In Revelation 14, verse 19, we read, And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Verse 20 says, And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even into the horse's bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Revelation 19, verse 17, we read, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together into the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and of the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, flesh of horses, and them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Now back to verse 4. We read Isaiah says here, And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down, as the leaf falleth off the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. In this language we, of course, recognize immediately as language that is clearly quoted, of course, in the, in the New Testament, in particular at the loosing of the sixth seal in Revelation chapter 6, which reads, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Same imagery we see back here. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it was rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Of course, the Lord Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, mm-hmm. the, In those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Same imagery. Isaiah says, And the host of heaven shall be dissolved. As Peter also says in Second Peter chapter 3, Peter says that we are, we are to be looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved. Use that word dissolved. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So that 
sets the stage for the context of our theme of verse here in verse 8. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. So we see here, I think, the great significance of verse 8. And the reason that actually this verse forms the, the theme of this series of messages because the controversy that God spoke of in verse 8, the controversy of Zion, is the very same controversy that dominates debate among uh, nations today and at the UN and is bringing Israel and the world to the brink of world war, which will ultimately actually lead to the glorious return of our Lord to take His throne, as we see in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 26, but the judgment shall sit and they shall take away His dominion, the devil's dominion, to consume and to destroy it to the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. That's us, by the way. Whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey Him. Well, that's the basis for, and I believe, the crucial importance uh, and relevance of this series of messages. In part one of this series, we look briefly at some of the history of modern Zionism, which we defined as a movement among the Jewish people that supports the reestablishment of a Jewish homeland in the territory defined as the historic land of Israel, or what Rome then renamed as Palestine. And we also looked briefly at the history of the Six-Day War in part one, which ended exactly 50 years ago, yesterday on June 10th, and we saw in that message that uh, we as Americans have been led to believe that war was a defensive war, in which Israel is said to have defended itself against the vastly outnumbering forces of Egypt, Syria, and Jordan that were allegedly attacking Israel from three sides. Uh, that war was in truth and in fact an entirely offensive war of aggression, Amen. designed with the single and sole purpose of occupying Palestinian land in the West Bank to establish Israeli settlements in that area. Included in that history, we briefly mentioned uh, the Israeli attack on American forces at that time via its premeditated, fully intentional, and treacherous attack on a U.S. naval vessel, the USS Liberty. I'll come back to detail that history in a moment. But then we turned our attention uh, to the Bible in particular and to Bible prophecy as it relates to Israel and to God's promises to regather the Jews to that land in the last day before Christ's return. And we looked somewhat in depth at Christ's prophecy in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. And his admonition there to pay special heed, special attention to Daniel's prophecy of the abomination of desolation in Daniel 9, which we saw in that study can only be fulfilled by the Antichrist, not by Christ, as some imagine and which shows that the Jews must be regathered to the land while still in unbelief before that seven-year period defined by that 70th week of Daniel in Daniel 9.27 can start. They've got to be in that land because the covenant that's confirmed in that verse must be confirmed with the Jews in the land of Israel. And the breaking of that covenant then specifically relates to the temple that is to be rebuilt on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. It has to happen which we also know from a previous study, is the supreme and highest goal of the Masonic Lodge and the Freemasonry to rebuild that temple in Jerusalem. In part two, then, we looked at Isaiah chapter 11, where we saw that the Lord shall set His hand again the second time to recover the remnant of His people, which shall be left, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. We looked at Luke 21 as well. We saw that Luke is the only one of the Gospel writers that records Christ's prophecy both of the events of A.D. 70 when Rome destroyed Jerusalem then also of the future tribulation period. And we saw there that the preterist interpretation of these passages that Christ's uh, prophecy there are, were, were fulfilled in A.D. 70 is completely impossible. And from which we can dogmatically conclude that there will be a second regathering of the Jews, of the outcast of Israel, the dispersed of Judah, uh, which can only occur after the second casting out and second dispersion, Amen. which happened in AD 70. So we proved that. And so therefore, that second regathering must occur during or at the end of the church age, which we saw to our delight, even the great 
Prince of Preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, agrees with our position. Thanks. Even being post-trib, I love that. Yeah. Great to see that. We also began looking at Romans 9 through 11 in that message, which continued last time in the part four, where we refuted the heresies on both sides of the debate, including Stephen Anderson's heresy that God doesn't know who the real Jews are today or uh, that there are no true Jews today because their bloodlines have been too mixed with Stephen Anderson's teaching. And then, even more importantly, we refuted the damnable heresy of C.I. Schofield and that uh, most antichrist and gluttonous cronies of Schofield, heretics in our day, namely John Hagee, that the Jews can come to God through a separate covenant, a separate gospel, that they have a separate kingdom and a separate destiny from that of the church, which Paul completely disproves throughout his epistles, especially in Romans chapter 11, from which we drew two dogmatic conclusions. First was that God is not through with Israel as a nation, that a day will come when the fullness of the Gentiles have come in, apparently a specific number of God's elect, and after that day comes, God will bring some form of restoration to Israel. And then secondly, we saw that the restoration that God has in view for Israel is not a separate destiny from the church. We share the same destiny and the same kingdom. Not a separate kingdom, not a separate destiny, as Schofield teaches dogmatically in the Schofield reference so-called Bible. Paul says in that chapter that there is only one olive tree. One root, one olive tree, not two. We've seen all other passages dealing with how God treats uh, the Jews and Gentiles, that there are not two peoples of God. There is one new man, one olive tree. Jesus said there would be one fold and one shepherd. One group of chosen people whom God calls His elect. And the day is coming. After Paul says the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. When the Lord Jesus said the times of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled, that God will open the eyes of the unbelieving Jews that still remain in the land at that time. And they will finally see what they have done as a nation in rejecting their Messiah. In receiving a false Messiah who turned on them and betrayed them after they rejected their true Messiah, having demanded His death on the Roman cross and saying His blood be on us and on our children after saying we have no king but Caesar. But that day's not here yet. That day not here yet. I went through all that to help us to stay balanced and focused as we now begin to look today at the treachery, the tyranny, and the Antichrist, satanic wickedness that exists today in the modern state of Israel. And as we do so, we dare not presume to know God's mind in all matters pertaining to modern modern day Israel and to the Jews. What we can say, however, is this is what the Bible says. That's where we have to stand. And the Bible says that murder is wrong. And theft of land and real estate is wrong. Waging war for the sole purpose of displacing and dispossessing a culture of people to take their land is wrong. God commanded Moses, the Israelites, in the days of Moses and Joshua, to go in and take the land, to kill all the Canaanites. Yes. That command does not apply today. It doesn't apply today. This is not that day. Amen. God's command to Moses and Joshua 3,500 years ago to wipe out the Canaanite does not apply today despite the apparent attitude of the leadership in Israel, which seems to be what they, what they believe, and also among many unthinking pro-Zionist Christians today as well, many of whom are our friends. They're just, they're just, they won't see this. That's why we're preaching this message. However, that does not mean that the migration of Jews to Palestine was not orchestrated under the hand of God with God working providentially to bring His ultimate will to pass in that land as I believe it was. So, in the introduction to our video, America the Babylon, I stated that the typical American Christian's view of America itself must change. And that's still very true. But I want to add to that, that in this message, that the typical American Christian view of national Israel also must change. Amen. The view that Christians should stand for Israel no matter what they do, and no matter what type of atrocities that they commit against the Palestinians must change. 
And we can conclude today that we as Christians have no obligation to the nation of Israel. They are in God's hands, not ours. And we should not say, I stand with Israel no matter what they do, no matter what type of atrocity they commit. And further, we should have nothing to do with assisting the unbelieving and for the most part atheist Jews in that land to continue in unbelief yeah, and an outright hatred of Christ and everything Christian. Yes, amen. We should not do that. And that is the mindset of most in Israel today. Outright hatred of Christ and all that is Christian. And if you disagree at this moment, I hope that you'll just stay tuned and hear me out. As for the Arab-Israeli War of 1967, the true facts of history clearly show that the leadership in Israel at the time in 1967 knew full well that there was no danger of any impending threat of attack from Egypt, from Jordan, or from Syria. No threat of attack. They were not being, there, was, there, was no, there were no Arab troops massed on the border. That's not true. And the leadership in Israel at that time also knew that Egypt's, Egyptian President Nasser's uh, loan buildup in the Sinai was strictly out of fear of an Israeli attack, which the CIA had, at that time had informed U.S. President Lyndon Johnson was coming several days before it finally came. And these are all documented facts. To briefly reiterate a few points made in part one of the message on this point, Israel's sixth prime minister, Menachem Begin, who, by the way, was also the leader of an underground paramilitary group in Israel called the Irgun in the 1940s, uh, which group was responsible, by the way, for several atrocities committed against Palestinian Arabs during the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. In 1982, Menachem Begin, if you'll recall, I mentioned this before, I gave a speech before uh, Israel's National Defense College, and the speech was on wars without choice versus wars of one's own choosing. That was the title of his speech. And in that speech, he clearly defended the 1967 attack by Israel against its neighbors as a war of one's own choosing. And while attempting to defend the Six-Day War as a preemptive defensive war, Begin said this, In June 1967, we again had a choice. The Egyptian army concentrations in the Sinai approaches do not prove that Nasser was really about to attack us. This is Menachem Begin talking. He said, we must be honest with ourselves. We decided to attack him. That's what Menachem Begin said. Yitzhak Rabin, Israel's chief of staff in 1967, who also later became prime minister until his assassination in 1995, he said in a 1968 interview, the year after the war, he said, I do not think Nasser wanted war. The two divisions he sent to the Sinai would not have been sufficient to start an offensive against Israel. He knew it, and we knew it. Yitzhak Rabin is on record as saying that. One of Israel's top generals at the time, named Matayahu Peled, Peled, P-E-L-E-D, he said to pretend that the Egyptian forces massed on our frontiers or in a position to threaten the existence of Israel, constitutes an insult not only to the intelligence of anyone capable of analyzing this part of this sort of situation, but above all an insult to the IDF or the Israeli Defense Forces. He called it the, the Zahal at that time. But uh, he said that was an offense, an insult to the Israeli army. Peled then later uh, became a member of Israel's parliament, the Knesset, and he became an outspoken critic, actually, of the occupation of the occupied territories until he died in 1995. General Pellet's son, as I mentioned last time also, his son has taken up his father's cause and is an outspoken critic of Israel's oppression of the Palestinian population in the occupied territories, to whom Israel denies the right to vote and to participate in their so-called allegedly democratic government. It was only democratic for the Jews, not for the Palestinians. So it's actually no more democratic. That's the problem with democracy. Yeah, that's the problem with democracy. Exactly, it's mobocracy. It's no more democratic than uh, the so-called apartheid in South Africa was alleged to be. I repeat that I strongly recommend to uh, everyone that hears this message that you also go online to YouTube and find, there are several videos there posted by Miko Pellet. 
The General Sun. In fact, he has also he has a book out titled The General Sun that um, I'd like to get and read. I haven't done that. Along these lines also, in, uh, on May 11, 1997, the New York Times reported the following. This is the New York Times. They said, Moshe Dayan, the Israeli general, he was a celebrated commander who, as defense minister in 1967, gave the order to conquer the Golan, Golan Heights. He said, many of the firefights with the Syrians were deliberately provoked by Israel. And the kibbutz residents, meaning the farming residents in that area, northeast, uh, who pressed the government to take the Golan Heights, did so less for security than for farmland. Diane stated, they didn't even try to hide their greed for the land. We would send a tractor to plow some area uh, where it wasn't possible to do anything in the, in the demilitarized area, and knew in advance that the Syrians would start to shoot. If they didn't shoot, we would tell the tractor to advance further until in the end the Syrians would get annoyed and they'd finally shoot. And then we would use artillery and later the Air Force also, and that's how it was. The Syrians on the fourth day of the war were not a threat to us. That's Moshe Dayan, the, the former commander of the Israeli uh, Air Force, General Ezer Weitzman, stated that there was no threat of destruction, but that the attack on Egypt, Jordan, and Syria was nevertheless justified so that Israel could exist according to the scale, spirit, and quality she now embodies. In other words, the 1967 Six-Day War was in fact a war of aggression launched by Israel to expand the goal of Zionism and reclaim the land once promised to Abraham, to take the land from the Palestinians. That's what that war was all about, which, as we'll see, I believe, from the Bible, in part six of this message, was done prematurely and not in God's timing, I believe. But as further evidence that the 1967 war was for Israel completely and fully a war of aggression and not of defense, designed and carried out with the sole purpose of seizing land in the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, and the Golan Heights. I now want to give some additional detail today on the events that occurred on the fourth day of the sixth day Arab-Israeli War. I begin this part of the message with a detailed account of an event that transpired just over 50 years ago, 50 years ago this past Thursday, on June 8, 1967, in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea, 12 miles off uh, the southwest coast of Israel. That event was the brutal, treacherous, double-crossing, and merciless attack by the nation of Israel against a naval vessel of the, of the United States, Israel's number one ally in the world, supposedly, right, then and now. This account is from an article by Paul Craig Roberts. If you don't know who he is, he is a former assistant secretary of the Treasury under uh, Ronald Reagan. He was basically Reagan's uh, policy strategist in, in economics. This is what Wikipedia says of Paul Craig Roberts himself. It says he is a strong critic of the Bush and later Obama administration's handling of the war on terror. He's taken positions strongly at odds with mainstream politicians, harshly criticizing the ineffectiveness, severity, and high rates of incarceration associated with the war on drugs, excessive police violence and use of SWAT teams against civilians, and congressional approval of increased government surveillance associated with the war on terror, which he views as fundamental threats to the liberties enshrined in the U.S. Constitution, opening the way for an oligarchic police state to be imposed upon the U.S. population. He's my kind of guy. Yes. Right? Yeah. Paul Craig Roberts. For these reasons, Paul Craig Roberts is actually one of the very few former government insiders that I listen to yeah. who I believe to be highly credible along with Ron Paul and David Stockman as well, who also served under Reagan. Now, pay attention. The article is a bit long, but for, if for no other reason than as a memorial, the 34 American sailors that were murdered and 174 that were wounded in that attack. I'm going to read this article. By the way, I also read the article rather than paraphrase in order to give the account more credibility because... I want you to know that these are Paul Craig Roberts' words, not mine. That's why I read the article. Titled, the, the Israeli Attack on the USS Liberty. June 8, 1967. The fourth day of the Sixth Day War between Israel and Egypt, Syria and Jordan. It was a beautiful day in the Mediterranean. The USS Liberty was in international waters off the coast of Egypt. 
Israeli aircraft had flown over the USS Liberty in the morning and had reported that the ship was American. The crew, in, in close proximity to the war zone, this was a few days after Israel started this war with Egypt, Jordan, and Syria, was reassured by the presence of, of Israeli aircraft. Because they're supposed to be friendly, right? But at 2 p.m., sailors sunbathing on the deck saw fighter jets coming at them in attack formation. Red flashes from the wings of the fighters were followed by explosions, blood, and death. Beautiful afternoon suddenly became a nightmare. Who was attacking the USS Liberty and why? The attack on the Liberty was an attack on America. The Liberty was an intelligence ship. It just, its purpose was to monitor Soviet and Arab communications in order to warn both Israel and Washington should the Soviets enter the war on behalf of its Arab allies. The Liberty was armed only with four machine guns to repel borders. Its request for a destroyer escort had been denied. The assault on the Liberty is well documented. With no warning, the Liberty was attacked by successive waves of unmarked jets using cannon, rockets, and napalm. The attacking jets jammed all U.S. communication frequencies, an indication that they knew the Liberty was an American ship. The air attack failed to sink the Liberty. About 30 minutes into the attack, three torpedo boats appeared flying the Star of David. The Israeli boats were not on a rescue mission. They attacked the Liberty with cannon, machine guns, and torpedoes. One torpedo struck the Liberty midship, instantly killing 25 Americans while flooding the lower decks. The Israeli torpedo boats destroyed the life rafts the Liberty launched when the crew prepared to abandon ship, sending the message there would be no survivors. At approximately 3.15, two French-built Israeli helicopters carrying armed Israeli troops appeared over the Liberty. Phil Turney could see their faces only 50 to 60 feet away. Surviving crew members are convinced the Israelis were sent to, to board and kill all survivors. The Israeli jets destroyed the Liberty's communications antennas. While under attack from the jets, crew members strung lines that permitted the ship to send a call for help. The USS Saratoga and USS America launched fighters to drive off the attacking aircraft, but their rescue mission was aborted by direct orders from Washington. When the Liberty notified the 6th Fleet, it was again under attack, this time from surface ships. The fleet commander ordered the, the carriers, America and Saratoga, to launch fighters to destroy or drive off the attackers. The order was encrypted and picked up by Israel, which immediately called off its attack. Torpedo boats and hovering helicopters sped away. Israel quickly notified Washington that it, that it had mistakenly attacked an American ship. And the U.S. fighters were recalled a second time. The USS Liberty suffered 70% 70, 70 casualties with 34 killed and 174 wounded. Although the expensive state-of-the-art ship was kept afloat by the, by the heroic crew, it later proved unsalvageable and was sold as scrap. Question, why didn't help come? No explanation has ever been given by the U.S. government for Defense Secretary Robert McNamara, President Lyndon Johnson's orders for the 6th Fleet to abort the rescue mission. Lieutenant Commander David Lewis of the Liberty told colleagues that Admiral L.R. Geis, commander of the 6th Fleet Carrier Force, told him that when he challenged McNamara's order to recall the rescue mission, LBJ, President Johnson, came on the line and said he didn't care if the ship sank, he wasn't going to embarrass an ally. The communications officer handling the transmission has given the same account. A BBC documentary on the Israeli raid reports that confusion about the attacker's identity almost resulted in a U.S. assault on Egypt. The U.S. government's official position on the USS Liberty corresponds with Israel's. The attack was unintentional and a result of Israeli blunders. By the way, Israel doesn't make those kind of blunders. No. No. This is the official position despite the fact that CIA Director Richard Helms, Secretary of State Dean Rusk, Assistant Secretary of State Lucius Battle, and a long list of U.S. Navy officers, government officials, and Liberty survivors are on record saying the Israeli attack was intentional. Yeah. According to Helms, Battle in the minutes of a White House meeting, President Johnson believed the attack was intentional. Helms says LBJ was furious and complained when the New York Times buried the story on page 29, but that Johnson decided he had to publicly accept Israel's explanation the political pressure was too much, Helms said. 
U.S. communications personnel, intelligence analysts, and ambassadors report having read U.S. intercepts of Israeli orders to attack the Liberty. In one intercept, an Israeli pilot reports that the Liberty is an American ship and asks for a repeat and clarification of his orders to attack an American ship. One Israeli who identified himself as one of the pilots later came to America and met with U.S. Representative Pete McCloskey and Liberty survivors. The pilot said he had refused to participate in the attack when he saw it was an American ship. He was arrested upon returning to base. Liberty flew the U.S. flag, the ship's markings, GTR-5, measured several feet in height on both sides of the bow. On the stern, the ship was clearly marked USS Liberty, was taking the liberty for an Egyptian ship, as Israel, as Israel claims to have done, was impossible. Yeah. Tattered flags show the ferocity of the, the attacks. The Israelis claim the liberty flew no flag, but two U.S. flags full of holes from the attack exist. When the first flag was shot down, crewmen replaced it with the flag 7 feet by 13 feet. This flag with its battle scars is on display at NSA headquarters in Fort Meade, Maryland. Admiral John McCain, Jr., father of the current U.S. Senator, ordered Admiral Isaac Kidd and Captain Ward Boston to hold a court of inquiry and to complete the investigation in only one week. In a signed affidavit, Captain Boston said President Johnson ordered a cover-up and that he and Admiral Kidd were prevented from doing a real investigation. Liberty survivors were ordered to never speak to anyone about the event, their silence, their silence was finally broken 12 years later when Lieutenant Commander James M. Ennis published his book, Assault on the Liberty. I'm almost done with the article. It's now an established fact that the attack on the Liberty was intentional, was covered up by President Johnson, and every administration since. There's never been a congressional investigation, nor has the testimony of the majority of survivors ever been officially taken. Moreover, testimony that conflicted with the cover-up was deleted from the official record. Disgusted by the U.S. government's official stance discounting the survivors' reports, Admiral Tom Moore, retired Chief of Naval Operations and Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, organized the Moore Commission to make public the known facts about the attack and cover-up. The commission consisted of Admiral Moore, former Judge Advocate General of the U.S. Navy, uh, Navy Admiral Merlin Staring, Marine Corps General Raymond Davis and former U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia James Aikens. The commission's report concluded that there is compelling evidence that, it, that Israel's attack was a deliberate attempt to destroy an American ship and kill her entire crew. That fearing conflict with Israel, the White House deliberately pre prevented the U.S. Navy from coming to the defense of the, of the USS Liberty by recalling the Sixth Fleet military rescue support while the ship was under attack that surviving crew members were threatened with court-martial, imprisonment, or worse, if they exposed the truth, and the survivors were abandoned by their own government, that there has been an official cover-up without precedent in American naval history. This is what this commission re report said, that a danger to our national security exists whenever elected officials are willing to subordinate American interests to those of any foreign nation. That's treason, by the way. Yeah, it is. That's treason. Mm -hmm. Why did Israel attack the liberty? Was something super secret going on that's so damaging it must be protected at all costs? Some experts believe that Tel Aviv decided to sink the liberty because the ship's surveillance capability would discover Israel's impending invasion and capture of Syria's Golan Heights, yep. which, it, which Washington did not want them to do. Others believe Israel was concerned the liberty would discover Israel's brutal massacre of hundreds of Egyptian prisoners of war, yep. a war crime contemporaneous with the attack on the U.S. ship happened at the same time. Still others believe that Israel intended to blame the attack on Egypt in order to bring America into the war. It's, that's not true. They, they entered that war too quickly. They, they, they didn't need us. It is known that the U.S. are providing Israel with reconnaissance and that there were joint U.S.-Israeli covert operations against the Arabs that Washington was desperate to keep secret. Robertson says... Survivor Phil Turney said that being forced to live with a cover-up is like being raped, and no one will believe you. Survivor Gary Brummett said he feels like someone who has been locked up for 40 years on a wrongful conviction. He says, until the U.S. government acknowledges the truth of the attack, Brummett says the survivors are forced to live with the anger and dismay of being betrayed by the country they serve. 
Survivor Bryce Lockwood has been, angry, has been angry for 40 years. The torpedo that killed his shipmates, wrecked his ship, and damaged his health was made in the USA. Appropriate. Surv yeah, that's right. Survivor Ernie Gallo told me that he has been haunted for four decades by the knowledge that his commander-in-chief recalled the U.S. fighters that could have prevented most of the Liberty's casualties. Treason. Every American should be troubled by the fact, he writes, last paragraph, that the President of the United States and the Secretary of Defense prevented the U.S. 6th Fleet from protecting a U.S. Navy ship and its 294-man crew from a foreign attack. They should also be troubled that the President ordered the Navy to determine if the attack was unintentional. That line ends the article. This shows the absolutely ruthless mindset of the leadership that existed in Israel at that time, and by the way, still exists yeah. in Israel, which despite the public rhetoric, has not changed from that day to this. Nor has the mindset of cover-up. The mindset of cover-up, lies, and deceit in Washington, D.C., which has only grown worse since those days. That in itself should wake Christians up to the fact that no Christian anywhere should say, I stand with Israel no matter what. Yeah. The undeniable facts of Israel's attack on the USS Liberty lead to only one undeniable conclusion. There is no way on God's green earth or in hell itself that Israel's attack on the USS Liberty was done by accident or by mistake, as both Israel and Washington continue to claim. That's a big lie, and they both know it. And that in itself is actually one more piece of evidence that the 1967 Six-Day War was itself also, and clearly, not a defensive war on Israel's part. That's another big lie that Christian Zionists of all shapes, sizes, and colors must come to grips with, so that they, can, they themselves can stop propagating this big lie. We're going to come back in the next part of the series to debunk and disprove a few other lies as well, including the fallacy pushed by many Zionists that Palestinians don't exist, that there are no Palestinians for us to concern ourselves about. And while it is clearly not true that Palestinians do not exist, it is certainly true that the Canaanites are no longer in existence. They're long gone, long dead, thousands of years ago. The Canaanites as a people were assimilated into the other people of the land, and the mixed multitude that God allowed to come into the land during the Assyrian occupation, when he drove out the ten tribes from the northern kingdom of Israel. And he allowed the Syrians to come in. And for those of us who love the word of God, and who study our Bibles, and who therefore love Old Testament history, we all need to just drop the nostalgia. And remember that these are not Old Testament times. That's right. The Mosaic mandate to wipe out the Canaanite does not apply today. Amen. Some Christians are still living in the past. And they refuse to acknowledge that God warned Israel when he gave that command to Moses, that if they rebelled against him, he would drive them off out of that land, which is exactly what he has done. And it is not up to us to decide when in God's timetable that judgment on the Jews will be brought to an end. However, the evidence from the Bible is that that day is not yet here. I'll, I'll come back to that next time. i got much more to say on this topic, how Zionist Jews have truly attempted to eradicate the Palestinian population that did own that land before them, just to plunder and steal their property. Yes, God did say he would gather the Jews back to that land. Yeah. However, as stated, the view that Christians should stand for Israel no matter what they do, and no matter what type of atrocities they commit against the Palestinians, I believe must change. Amen. We as Christians have no obligation to the tiny nation of Israel. They are in God's hands, not ours. We should not say, I stand with Israel no matter what. Amen. And further, we should again have nothing to do with assisting the unbelieving atheist Jews in that land to continue in their unbelief and an outright hatred of Christ and of all that is Christian. In his word, the Lord God Almighty says that he will regather Israel to that land. And he doesn't need any assistance from the mighty American, American military to do that. He needs no assistance to, to regather them to that land. Furthermore, to all those Christian so-called Zionist warmongers 
who condoned Israel's wars of aggression against the Palestinians, and who also joined hands with that rabid heretic and half-crazed lunatic from San Antonio, John Hagee, who says the American military should attack Iran and continue its own wars of aggression in the Middle East region to protect Israel. It's about time for those folks to either pull their heads out of the sand or wake up from the anesthetic that they've been under and see that the mighty American military is in fact the very military machine controlled and directed from its puppet masters in Rome about which the Bible says in Revelation 13 they worship the dragon which gave authority into the beast and they worship the beast saying who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him we have more to share on this topic next time Lord willing God still does have a plan for Israel but until he fulfills it we need to be balanced in our view of Israel there is a popular saying for today from the Mexican American war that says remember, remember the Alamo and for today, I suggest that we should also remember the USS Liberty and the American sailors that were brutally murdered by the government of Israel. And in so doing, we should adopt a position of refusing to support the wrongs that, that have been done to, to the Palestinian people, many of whom are indeed Christian. We'll see more on that, say more on that next time as well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, we thank you for, uh, for your word. We thank you for your great and precious promises. We know, Lord, that you have said that you will regather your people. We also know, Lord, that you drove them out of that land. The Lord Jesus said that their house left to them desolate. I pray that you'd help give us all insight and discernment and wisdom into these things. Help us to be balanced in our views. Help us to understand that you've not set aside your law, that murder is murder and theft is theft. Help us to understand your will for, the, for Israel. Help us to reconcile all, all these truths together. And to be balanced and to just maybe sit back and see what you do. Let you take charge over there and just let you do your, your will in the nation of Israel. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.